So for nearly 20 years, I uh, supplied decorative lighting to independent retailers around the country, about half of that time uh, with the corporation, and about the last half of that as an independent. And one thing that always amazed me was the difference between different retailers who seemed to be the same, and yet they weren't. It's a bit strange. I remember going down to Dorset, and I won't mention the town in case you know them. You may be from there. And there was this beautiful uh, showroom, and it had a long, long window frontage, and beautiful uh, products in the store. Uh, they were a customer of mine, and they had traffic going up and down this street. It was like a busy, busy place. And yet, bizarrely, they didn't really make much money. And I wondered, wha what was going on there? You know, what was, what was going on there? Because then I would visit other stores, and I remember visiting a store in Stoke-on-Trent, uh, if I don't mind telling you, uh, E2 Lighting, a friend of mine, Jamie, who runs that shop, down a side street, hardly any window space. Uh, you wouldn't think of going there to buy your lighting. And yet his sales were going through the roof. And so I started kind of asking myself the question, why is it that one retailer can generate twice as much turnover with the same resources and opportunities as their nearest competitor? I'm kind of playing that around in my mind. How is it that two retailers can generate vastly different sums of money, maybe sometimes in the same town, similar showrooms, similar products, and, I, and it kind of kept on mulling over in my head, and I, I thought, gosh, there's got to be a reason for that. And then I thought, if we could understand what was going on in that retailer's shop, a high-performing retailer, understand those principles, the methodology, and then apply those same principles to your showroom, surely we'll get the same results? Would you agree with that? Because I think success leaves clues, doesn't it? And I think success is also a choice. It's a decision that we make, that we're going to make it happen no matter what. And we're going to find out how to do it. So a lot of the things I'm going to share with you today, you may have heard from before, they may seem familiar. Uh, and I, I have spoken to lots and lots of retailers around the country in recent years, but certainly over the last 20 years. And most of them, like you, I'm sure, very passionate about what they do. They're very good at what they do. And you could actually call them experts. And what I found is it's very rare that with the things I'm going to share with you today, that the retailers that I meet anyway, they're not doing, they're it's not that they're doing nothing. That most of the time they get pretty eight, 70, 80% of the, of, of the things right. And it's just that missing 20% maybe that is going to make all the difference. And I'm really hoping that today, if we really tune in to what I'm going to share with you today, uh, that you might pick up on that one thing and walk out today and go, that's the thing I've been missing. So if it comes to your mind, make a note of it. And what you'll also find, from my own personal experience and experience with a lot of retailers, is often that one thing that we've been avoiding, the one thing that we're scared to do, and yet it's the very thing that would transform your business. So, my dad was in uh, retail all of his life. And uh, he was, I had the privilege of working with him in my early years. I was going to say the late 1970s, but I know you won't believe me because I'm far too young looking to be working in the late 1970s. I started when, I think, child labor. That's what was, that was going on there. So, uh, and I, ha I had a great time working with him, worked with him for about five years. And he was a very talented manager. He was very good with his staff, very good with his customers. And uh, he, he, he was very well known for transforming failing stores to these thriving outlets when he was working for a large corporation. And they were, <laughs> which was good in one way, but the other way, as a family and small children, we'd end up moving all around the country, we even went to South Africa for a while, because that's where they wanted him to work, because he, he had this magical touch. So I learned a lot from him. And yet, when he decided to go into his own retail business as an independent retailer, 
he really struggled. Really, really struggled to, to get it off the ground. And I often wondered what happened. What, what was it that caused him to, to struggle so much? Did he suddenly lose all of those talents, all that experience, all those skills? Did they suddenly disappear? Well, of course not. And again, it, for years I wondered what it was. Was it just bad luck? What was it that caused him to struggle so much? It's only in recent years when I was doing research for my book that it dawned on me that, that the key difference that made it difficult for my dad to succeed. And I believe that many retailers are missing this key ingredient, if you like. And if we can grasp this, it can be transformational for your business. I believe that my dad either was unable to, or maybe he didn't know how to, to be fair, identify and clearly identify his, his value as a retailer. I'm not talking about the products, I'm talking about the showroom, I'm talking about him, Derek Retallick, his experience, and then communicate that value to the marketplace. So the fundamental difference between the two retailers that you saw in the earlier example is value, okay? Not about the products, not about the showroom, that's important. All of that needs to be in place, but I know that you've already got that in place in most cases. In most cases, you know what you're doing. It's your personal value that gets left behind on the shelf. It's your personal value that gets left on the table. The first law of economics is that you get paid primarily for value. And in this case, I'm talking about your personal value. So if we can somehow harness that personal value that you have, that personality, your uniqueness, your skills, your talents, and then publicize that across the country, wouldn't that be a force to be reckoned with? Because I don't believe that the high street is dead at all. I don't even think we need, I mean, they're lovely slogans and I support them 100%. Save the high street, it's great. But actually, we can do that as individuals. Because when I go into stores around the country, and you'll have experienced this as well, in most independent retailers, they just give this great service, they love what they do, they're passionate. And so people come away from that shop and go, yeah, I had a great time there. But how do you globalize that? How do you scale that up? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, here's an interesting thought. Having said that, no one will ever pay you what you are worth. You ever get that feeling? People come in, they spend a few hours with you, yeah? And they pick your brains, get your advice. And they think, yeah, you're not worth the price on the ticket. Definitely not. I can get that 30% cheaper on Amazon. That's what they think you're worth. So people won't pay you what you are worth. They'll only ever pay you what they think you're worth. And as Casey Brown says, and here's the good news, you control their thinking. Not zombie-like, but you control their thinking. And the way that you control their thinking is by clearly identifying and then communicating your value to the marketplace, which is absolutely essential for getting paid well for your expertise. Absolutely crucial. So I get uh, a lot of questions about how do you do that? How do you clearly identify that? How do you communicate your value to the marketplace so that people will pay you a fair price for your products and services? You deserve it, you're doing a great job. You're giving this expertise, expertise away. Now it's not something I can do in a half an hour talk, but I can certainly give you some ideas and pointers and directions. Uh, but that's actually what I do for a living. I'm a retail coach, I'm also the author of this book. David and Goliath, how independent retailers can take on the giants and win. And so I work with well-established retailers. Uh, they've been around a few years. They've got a nice concept, a nice business, and they're just struggling to get it to the next level. And they're open to new ideas. They're willing to learn. I don't have to gr drag them kicking and streaming to a, to a workshop. That's the kind of people that I deal with and work with. And it's fun, it's enjoyable. So if you feel that what I've just said describes your situation, you may be interested to know uh, that I have a workshop on the 27th of February here in Birmingham. 
the normal uh, retail price is £157, but as a special spring fair offer, it's retailing at £97. So just think about that for a moment. I'll give you more details about that at the end of the session. Now, if you're going to grow your business, there's two things that it's absolutely critical to get right. The one is the law of the harvest, and the other is the right methodology or the right methods. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, very often, we focus too much on the methodology. The methodology is the how-to, how to make sales, how to, be, how to run a nice shop, how to uh, do a good window display, how to get your message onto your website and to social media. Those things are critical, and they're really, really important. But very often, what we miss is the law of the harvest. So, for example, imagine a farmer who's just bought the latest technology. He's brought a brand new tractor, and I'm not a farmer, so please forgive the technology, but I know what a tractor is. And they're going out into the field, and they're going to, and they want to they uh, plant the seeds and, and, and reap the harvest. But he's really excited because he's got this brand new tractor, and uh, he knows he's going to have a great harvest because he's got all the latest technology, all the right, all the right uh, machinery, and it's all working well for him. But he gets so excited that he forgets to actually plant the seeds in the spring and decides to take a bit of a break, takes an extended holiday in the summer, comes back autumn, puts his feet up a little bit, and then starts planting the seeds in winter. So he's got the how-to right, he's got all of the technology right, but he's messed up on the law of the harvest. Does that make sense? Okay. So his timing was wrong. So the law of the harvest, the way you, best way I can describe that is to think about principles. So what are your principles? What are your values? What are, you, what are your philosophies for business? Okay? What are these things that are important to you? And this is where, uh, when I was doing my research for my, uh, my book and also uh, for, for, uh, for my training programs, I came up with this idea here. And it's called The Seven Success Secrets of High-Performing Retailers. And what I found was that when I spoke and, uh, to, to lots and lots of retailers, independent retailers, and when I studied the national retailers, they were all doing these same seven things repeatedly over and over again. And I thought, well, if we can repeat that into your business, then surely you're going to get the same results. Would you agree with that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, you've got to ask yourself the question, why did I decide to call it the seven success secrets? Why a secret? Because it's not really a secret. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could find this information on the internet. It's not, it's not hidden. And the reason I called it a secret was last year I was speaking on the main stage uh, at the Autumn Fair here. And on the same stage was, was Theopathetus. Not at the same time, but he was speaking before me. And he drew a huge crowd and a very inspirational speaker. But when I spoke to the sound engineer, I don't think it was this one, but it was uh, another sound engineer, and I said, how's the talks been going over the four days? And he said, yeah, pretty good. I've learned a lot. But interestingly, the person I learned the least from was Theopathetus. Really? What's going on there? Now, it wasn't that Theo was a bad speaker. He was inspirational, he's enthusiastic, he loves what he does, he's very famous, we know him from Dragon's Den. So he's a very engaging speaker. The problem was that he wasn't able to communicate his principles or his methodology in a way that the audience could go away and go, ah, if I do this, this, and this, I'll start to be like Theo and start making money like he does. He just wasn't able to do it. And it was only when I read his biography that I began to unpick all the things that he did to help him to be successful. And these same seven secrets apply to Theo, apply to top businessmen, and they apply to independent retailers. And again, let's just have a quick look at that and see what the uh, things are that they're doing. The first thing that I found was everyone that was really, really successful had this dream, this vision, if you like, this ideal of what they wanted to achieve. Now, in his book, 12 R Rules for Life, uh, Jordan Peterson says that what you aim at determines what you see. What you aim at determines what you see. So, if your aim is to pay the overheads, the corporation tax, the VAT, the wages, all of that, then all you'll see are really opportunities to do that. But if your aim is up here, what kind of lifestyle do I want to achieve? What kind of holidays do I want to go on? What kind of house do I want to live in? 
What kind of car would I like to drive? How would I like to spend more time with my family? What fun things would I like to do? And you get really crystal clear on that. You start to see the opportunities to help you to achieve that. So don't dismiss this. It's really critical. I found this same principle coming up at time and time and time again. And the best way to do this is to write it down. Just get a blank piece of paper and write down. What do I want? Just imagine that money's no object. Write everything down. Okay. Or get pictures. I, I've got a book. I've got these photographs, pictures of ideal things that I wanted. Tick them off. Got the house, got the car, got the holiday. Go back to that one. That's really good. Or you can download images on your laptop, which is what I do as well. So I've got this sort of one minute turnaround every time. So I see these pictures. Oh, yeah, we're going to go there. We're going to buy that. We're going to do this. And it just kind of brightens your day up. So critical that you write it down. Don't leave it up here because then nothing happens. The next thing that I found was that it was really important to have a clear sense of purpose. So this is where it starts to become a little bit more um, actionable. So you action the things that you are dreaming about because if you just dream about it, nothing's going to happen. And there are three elements of creating a, uh, a, a, a sense of purpose. First is vision. Second is the physical written goals. And the third is having a sense of uh, purpose or the reason, the why you want to achieve these things. And again, this is what I found with retailers, top retailers around the country. This is what they did. You know, they knew, they had a vision. And vision is not about looking to the future with rose-tinted glasses. Not saying, well, we're going to have a really wonderful time and everything's going to work out beautifully. Having vision is looking ahead and seeing what's actually going to happen. What is the reality of the situation? You know, in the book of Proverbs, it says where there is no vision, the people perish. That sounds a bit harsh, but I think what they're saying is you've got to have a reality check. If I carry on doing what I'm doing, what's going to happen in three years' time, five years' time? Am I going to be in the same place? Am I is it going to be worse? But it's important to do that. Goals, make sure it's actionable, write these things down. And then the purpose is why you want to do these things in the first place. If you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, you're not going to pay the price that you will need to pay to get your business to the next level and get it up to wherever you want to take it to. Now, if you read the book, Start With Why by Simon Sinek, great book, I recommend that. He talks about having a reason and a purpose and a why to do these things. And the thing that struck me when I first read this a few years ago was that in order to discover your why or your reason, you look to the past, not to the future. And it just blew me away. I remember I was at a seminar in uh, London attending a workshop and I, 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 it just struck me. Look to the past to find the reason why you're doing things. So think about the past. Think about inspirational people, maybe a teacher, maybe someone you look up to. It could be a family member. In my case, it was my dad. You know, I look back at my, and, and my dad and you know, he, he just really inspired me. And I loved him as much as I love retailers, as much as I love retailers. And it made sense. Why do I keep gravitating to retail, retail, retail? Why was I writing a book about retailers? And that became my purpose. So if I can make a small difference just to one person today, to me, that would be worth it. That'd be absolutely brilliant. I've done what I came here to do. So that's really important that you take time to do that. The next part of the process is that you need to really enjoy and love what you do. It sounds daft. But again, the top retailers in the country really are passionate about what they do. And I know many of you are as well. We need to become highly valued, okay? So it's not about if only the high street would change, if the economy would change, if we could get rid of this silly Brexit, whatever that's going on over there. Because at the end of the day, it really comes down to you and your, your personal value. Now here's an example of... Uh, a friend of mine, Rob James, who really understood this and grasped this principle of clearly identifying his value and then communi communicating that value to the marketplace. Rob owns an interior design shop in Chandler's Ford. Beautiful, nice showroom, nicely located. But like many of you, he was having all these problems of people coming in, ripping them, not ripping them, but trying to get discounts uh, and competing with the internet and so on and so forth. So he had to look at his resources. And this is what I would encourage each of us to do today. It's just don't look, what you don't, don't look at what you don't have, look at what you have. And that's what he did. He said, you know what? I'm an interior designer. I've got all this expertise. I've got all this value. And I'm being undermined. So what he chose to do was he went out to uh, his customers' houses and he offered a free service a free interior design service. He'd go there for about an hour and he would discuss what they wanted 
and then he would make recommendations in the hope that they would come to the store. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. A few months later, he charged an 85 pound call out fee and they paid, non-refundable. A little while later, he went out and did lighting designs for these big houses, full houses. Guess how much he charged? 750 pounds, non-refundable, and they paid. A few months later, an expert in the industry said, Rob, you're doing a great job, but actually you're undercharging. Can you believe that? So he, <laughs> I just laugh when I hear this story because this time last year, just before I came on the stage, we were chatting down the aisles and, and he just told me that, they, that, he, that, that he doubled his call-out fee for lighting design to £1,500 <laughs> and they paid and they're still paying because he'd managed to package his value and communicate it to the marketplace in a way that they would pay. So just think about what value you have, because I know you have it. I know you have this uh, intrinsic value inside of you that is, that, that, that is not getting recognized. It's not being recognized at all in many cases. We then talk about exceptional service. So this is not about good service, because everybody gives good service. So that's not the differentia differential anymore. It has to be better than great service. It has to be exceptional. So this is where we go that extra mile. We make a little change here and there. We do the unexpected that customers are not wait, uh, expecting. But be very careful when you apply this principle. It comes with a safeguard, a, a warning sign, if you like, because you cannot give exceptional service to everybody. If you try that, you'll go out of business. The only people or the main people that you should be focusing on are your target audience. And that's why it becomes really important to know who your target customer is. If you don't know who your target customer is, again, perhaps this is something where you can start, get down, find out who they are. Because the closer you get to your target customer, the higher the value of your customer. Does that make sense? They value you more. Has anybody had an experience where you get, you had a customer come in the store and they're just lovely, you know, they like what you do, they appreciate you, you know, they don't haggle about price, they place a nice big order, they're just really nice, they're just nice people. But why not get more of people like that? But if we don't know who the target audience is, we don't know what we're aiming at. Critical to, to get that. By the way, there is a brochure here, if you want to take it away, it's got all of this in there. Uh, feel free to take that brochure, that's, that's no problem. Self-discipline, again, what I found with top deal, uh, uh, retailers was that they were self-disciplined in developing new habits in order to make them successful. So for example, you might be thinking today, do you know what, in order to get a bigger audience, I was speaking in Exeter um, a few weeks ago, and this young lady came up to me afterwards, really sweet, and she, she was saying, I'm, I want, I'm starting a new retail business, you know, I, wha what do you think I should do? And the first thing I spoke about was the target audience, perfect opportunity to get the target audience right, which she hadn't thought about. And I said, what about your, and she had skills, it was a gift shop she was opening, and she had lots of experience uh, in that area. What about speaking uh, at your local community events? And she was like terrified. She started shaking just while I was talking ab about it. Like she hadn't even gone on stage and she was shaking, but she got it. She realized that in order to make a difference, she needs to practice that skill. She needs to develop the self-discipline and the practice and go to Toastmasters or whoever it might be to be able to get uh, that experience of becoming a good speaker and whatever it might be for you. So don't be afraid to try something new. And then the last thing I found with all the best retailers around the country, they never give up. They never, ever give up. Now that doesn't mean we do the same thing over and over and over again and expect the same results. It means we make changes, we tweak things a bit here, we try new things, step out into the into the unknown sometimes and do that. It's really, really critical. So those are the seven principles that I found. So these are principles. This is the law of the harvest. Critical that we get that right and we keep on practicing. And I know from my experience that you probably have some of this under your belt already. But have a look and see what's missing and then focus on that. I get lots of questions about business. You know, how can I how can I grow my business? How can I make more sales? How can I get a decent margin? How can I get more customers into the store? And actually, fundamentally, the bottom line is, how can I get this lovely business that I've had for a few years to deliver the kind of lifestyle that I was hoping to get when I started the business? And that's the critical thing, is how can I do that? So now we're gonna talk a little bit about methodology. 
And in order to generate income, and here's an interesting statement. Anybody seen that before? Income follows assets. First time I heard that was uh, at a workshop about two years ago uh, by a man named uh, Daniel Priestley. He is the author of a many best-selling books, 24 Assets, uh, Oversubscribed, etc., etc. And that's what he said. Income follows assets. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Income follows assets. Well, think about it. Uh, if you have an asset, we traditionally we think about uh, buildings, we think about machinery, inventory, all of those kind of things. Those are assets that we can sort of generate money from and income from. In uh, some retailers, they've got a premises which they, they, which they own, but the problem with that is you can only generate income once you sell the business. The next thing down would be possibly the inventory or the products, and you can sell from that. You can, can class that as an asset. But again, the issue with that is that you don't really own the product in most cases unless you're making your own products. The person who really owns the, the, those assets is the supplier themselves because they own, they own the image rights, they own the distribution rights, they own the branding, and so they can sell whoever they want to. And don't be surprised if you suddenly see that on Amazon and you're now competing uh, with Amazon. So the best definition that I can find of income or of assets is a business asset is anything that is a unique to your business and would continue to add value even if you left the business, okay? So you might be thinking, oh, I've got to get assets. I need capital. How am I going to do that? Well, the good news is you don't need masses of capital to find assets because what we're going to talk about in a moment now is soft assets. What are soft assets? Okay. No. It's not a soft asset, okay, it's a teddy bear, it's soft, but it, that is not what we mean by a soft asset. What we mean by soft assets is, just to give you some examples, uh, well-produced videos on YouTube is a soft asset. Glossy brochures, so how many of you got a brochure? So I'm not talking about your product brochures that your suppliers give you, and it's all the product, I'm talking about a, your own glossy brochure, and it's something that t tells the story about you. It's a soft asset, okay? And, it, and it's really great because there's things that you can put in there and you can tell the story of your industry, maybe a few things that your customers should watch out for, and then you give them sort of seven tips or five tips or three tips to actually help them to avoid those traps. And if they stay with you, then they're not going to make those mistakes and they're going to get a good experience and actually they'll be more than happy to pay what you suggest that they pay. This is a, this is a great soft asset, glossy brochure. Blogs, best-selling book. I get lots of nice reviews, but it, I wouldn't say it's a best-selling book. But this book has, uh, is in, a, in and of itself, doesn't really make me much money, but it opens up doors. So it directs people to my business. I've had more speaking engagements in the last year or so than I've had ever since I had this book. So you might want to think about writing a book or an article. Soft assets, you can generate income from th those soft assets, but most often th they're going to direct people to your store and then that will be then transferred into money. A well-crafted website, of course, that's very important, goes without saying. A strong database, I hope you've got a good strong database. If you don't, then start building that database. Speak to your customers when they arrive. Can we get your email address? Keep you up to date with the latest promotions or the latest products that are coming in. Industry awards, if you've got an industry award, place it somewhere where people can see it on your website, in the shop. Intellectual property rights. Again, if you've got anything that's valuable to you, personal to you, tell people about it. You may have your own brand. You may want to develop your own brand. Think about setting up podcasts. Think about uh, business plans, how-to articles. People want to know how to do things. So if you're in industry, whether it's a gift shop, whether it's a lighting shop, a furniture shop, whatever it might be, tell people about how they can maximize uh, their experience at home. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see, and this is not an indictment to retailers because I absolutely love retailers and I think they and you are doing a great job, is we spend an awful lot of time on social media pro pr posting products, really nice products. That's, people don't go onto social media to buy products. That's not the primary reason they go. The primary reason they go is because they want to be entertained, informed, educated, catch up with their friends and have fun. So if all they see is products, 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 I think the one exception, maybe, 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 is Instagram. But all the other platforms, 
it's far more fun to see you. This is where earlier on I said, I'd clearly identify your value and communicate it to the marketplace. So, try this, okay? Do, do it, run a short video, little one, two minute video about how to, da 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 da, whatever it might be. And then make sure you post it regularly. Once a week is ideal, but maybe once a month would be even better. So when people come to onto your social media platforms or they come to your website, they go, oh, okay, that's Jill, that's John. They, they know what they're talking about, they know what they're doing. And I'll share an example with that in a moment. Industry reports, all of those things. This is an example that I mean. So Jerry Cheshire, uh, he owns a, um, obviously a bed shop in Surrey, Surrey Beds. He's been in uh, the bedding for about 16 years and he decided to write a book called Sleeping Blissfully, How to Make the Most of a Third of Your Life. Brilliant. So all of a sudden he's become the expert in the bed industry. So if people want beds, they go to Jerry. He then on his website puts uh, a little, press the button, find out the seven key mistakes that people make when buying a bed. So it doesn't matter if they don't, it's not saying come and buy from me, but if you click the button, you're going to be on his mailing list and then he's going to send you some information about beds and, and, and what's the latest trend. He said that when he first started doing this, and he's also got YouTube uh, videos, how-to videos, what's to watch out for, keeps everybody up to speed with that, posts them regularly. His average spend for a mattress was 500 pounds. After he started doing this for about a year, it went up to 1,000 pounds, and he had less people haggling about the discount. Because why? All of a sudden, he'd become the expert, and he had learned how to clearly identify his value and then communicate it to the value to the marketplace in a way that they were willing to pay him a fair price for his products and services. So there's a lot of information I'm giving you and I don't want to overload you. I'm really, what I'm hoping is that you'll take one or two ideas away today and go, that's what I'm going to do. If you can just write that down or make a note of it as soon as you get in the car and say, that's what I'm going to do today and then just stick to that and persist through that. And if it's scary, if it's something new, if it's something that you're not sure about, ask someone to help you. There are some really wonderful people out in the marketplace who can help you get the results that you want. One of the problems with independent being independent is often we think we have to be independent. No, you don't, okay? You can seek out help. Uh, find someone who can help you with that. So, I mentioned the, the workshop. Uh, it's a one-day masterclass, My Business, My Lifestyle. Normal price, 157 but it's 97 pounds. And what we're gonna be doing at this workshop is we're gonna be talking about your dare to dream strategy. We're gonna get very clear about that, how to make that super focus so you know exactly what you want and what you're gonna get. We're gonna help you develop an action plan so that you can get the results f uh, quicker. Also, we'll help you to clearly identify who your target audience is. This is absolutely critical. I'll be posting a video on YouTube tomorrow all about uh, identifying your target customer. Have a look at that. Uh, we'll be talking about soft assets as well and how you can uh, implement these soft assets into your business so you can get the kind of results that you want. And we'll focus on the one or two things that are important to you. There are so many that you can't do them all at the same time, but we'll help you to focus on the one that's relevant to your business. And then we're gonna help you to identify and communicate your value to the marketplace. Lastly, uh, I mentioned my book, uh, and I love this story of David and Goliath. And in my book, I talk about how David went to uh, the battlefield. Now, if you remember the story, everybody knows the story about David and Goliath. You may not know all the details, but we talk about David and Goliath. And here we have all the Davids and David S's, forgive me, um, uh, in, in the audience here today. And we've got the Goliaths, so your national chain stores, your Amazons, the big guys, they got all the muscle, all the money. And we're little Davids in the room here. We're trying to make a, make a business go and make it work. So what did David do? He was a shepherd and his father said, go to the battle, take some provisions for your brothers. You have three brothers in the field and uh, you know, make sure they're okay and looked after. So he went into the field and what was going on in that uh, battlefield was you had on the mountain on this side, you had the Israelites and on the mountain on this side, you had the Philist Philistines and they were trying to wage war against each other. And in the middle, you had a giant, six cubits high, which translates to nine foot, named Goliath. And he's got this armor, he's got this headgear, he's got the breastplate, everything there, massive sword, and he's taunting the Israelites. And he's saying, come on down, fight me. And uh, if I win, then we're gonna take over your territory and your families and everything. 
and he was really bad. For 40 days and 40 nights, he was taunting these people. David comes to the battlefield, starts giving his provisions to his three brothers, and he says, what's going on? What, what's this Philistine talking about? What, what, what is it? What, what's, what's the problem? Why are you not going into battle? He said, well, look at the size of him. He's nine foot. He's got a big sword. He's got this helmet. It's scary. And uh, he said, well, you know, we, we, we is there not a cause? He said, is there not a cause? And what did he mean by that? Well, you know, he wanted to fight for his liberty, his family, his faith, all of that. He had this real cause, and this is the reason. This is the why. That was his why. That was his purpose. And his brothers got a little bit jealous. And they said, well, you know, because they were older than him, and they were battle-hardened men. And he was just a boy. And they said, Phew, you know, who do you think you are coming up here and telling us what to do? And he said, well, I'll fight Goliath. If you can't be bothered, I'll fight him. And he went to King Saul, and Saul said, okay, uh, well, well, what we'll do is we'll set you up with this, with this, uh, this armor. We'll set you up with the armor and a sword. And they plonk this huge helmet on this young lad and this, this, this breastplate and all the armor, weighed him down, and he thought, I can't go into battle with this. If I go into battle like this, I'll, you know, I, ha I haven't proven this. I don't know how to, 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 to fight like this. It's not the way I do battle. And isn't that what happens as a retailer? We, we kind of, and I've seen it happen, not, all, not a lot, but I see it happen from time to time. You know what, I'm an independent retailer, I'm gonna hit Amazon front on. I'm gonna discount and discount and discount until I get out of business, okay? And that's what they want to do, go and fight Goliath on his grounds and the way that he fights. Don't do that. Your weapon is your value, your weapon are the soft assets, your weapon is your uniqueness. Please, please, please bring it to the forefront of your business. It's critical. And don't undervalue yourself. Uh, you know, if I can almost plead with you, I would. Don't undervalue yourself. Because that is what is critical and that's going to make the difference. So, David took off the armor and he put it on the floor and he had his slingshot and he had his five stones, nice smooth stones. He ran out to the battlefield. And we know, all know what happened next. Imagine those five stones are your soft assets, okay? And you're gonna go into battle against Goliath. He won't see you coming. And Goliath scoffed at David. You're coming at me like a dog? Who do you think I am? You know, what, what is this? And he swung that stone. And remember, he understood his value, he knew his worth, and he knew his purpose. And he'd also, this is not the first time he'd swung that sling because he had defended his sheep. He'd fought off bears and lions and all sorts of things. He knew what he was doing. Like all of you know what you're doing. And he swung that stone, hit Goliath, boom, and down he went. So I would encourage each of us to remember that story and to remember your value. And please clearly, 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 clearly identify that value, write it down, write, write, maybe write down a list of your skills and talents, speak to your, uh, a trusted friend, uh, so maybe a colleague or a family member and say, look, what am I good at? What are my skills? And then begin to communicate that value to the marketplace. I promise you that you will get results and you will remain in business for many years to come. Thank you so much for listening. I've enjoyed chatting with you and well, I've been doing all the talking, so thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Don't worry if you don't. You can come up to me afterwards and have a chat. Uh, I'm more than happy to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian, once again. Um, thank you for joining us on the main stage. And round of applause for Ian again, please. Thank you.